Off bass catches have more than tripled in the Gill Nest. Our production of smallmouth bass has gone through the roof in the, in the 90s and 2000s. We're sure that's happening with largemouth bass as well, but we don't have nearly the long term data set on them as we do on smallmouth. But we know largemouth would benefit from enhanced vegetation. We know both species would benefit from this clear water because their sight feeders are not as capable of feeding in highly turbid water as walleye are, so the conditions are like good. And I hate to say it, but crayfish turn out to be the number one preferred food for our smallmouth bass. When I read about rusty crayfish, they wipe out the vegetation here. Like, I assure you, that's not happening on our lake. They establish a higher density in the native crayfish. And if that's true, then that creates more food for the smallmouth bass. So I'm not saying we, we're happy we have rusty crayfish there, but in terms of bass, they might actually be serving a positive role. And that gets me to the, the philosophical aspects of the talk. I think if we had if we had an opportunity to flip a switch and say no more new invasive species in our systems, we would all agree that's a good thing to do. But if we got an opportunity to control or eradicate some of the invasive species that are currently there, our gut response would be, yeah, let's do that. But when you have these trade-offs between positives and negative impacts, I think you're gonna run into some, some stakeholder issues and some political issues, because I bet if you went in there and told the bass guys who are just tickled pink with what on our lake is like now and think it's a wonderful place and say, we're going to get rid of these mussels and return the lake back into the turbid cesspool that it was when it's a walleye lake, <laughs> that would not make them very happy. Nor would the landowners, whose aesthetic enjoyment of the lake is greatly enhanced by clear water phase that now lasts most of the summer, our big blueberry and algae blooms, for which the lake has been notorious since the very first explorers in 1700 last about a week, week and a half now. They used to last two or three months. So you tell people who have a house next to the lake, like to go swimming and boat and jet ski, we're going to turn the lake back into pea soup again. They're not going to be very happy. The walleye guys probably would be happy to get back their walleye fishery. And the landowners who can't back their boat out from their dock because of weeds <coughs> would be happy. But I, I suspect if you say, let's have a public meeting and talk about reversing all the impacts of mussels, that you're not going to get a consensus. And that's just something I, I'll toss out there. And I think gobies are going to be another good example for us. Everywhere they've been, vice versa, the bass are going to eat them up. The wall are going to eat them up. We'll get improved growth of our adult sport fish. They reproduce all season, which means there's going to be a steady supply of small prey for our young and beer pisciforce. Right now, our wall are having trouble staying on top of the yellow perch and frequently shift back to insects. If we have gobies. They'll probably be able to stay pisciforce all summer. They'll grow better, survive the winter better, and may, in fact, get enhanced year class development from the from the gobies. We might actually see increases in the walleye population because the gobies will be such a valuable food source for all life stages. Cormorants apparently love them even more than shag, so they're going to provide an extraordinarily good buffer for the cormorant predation of our game fish. They eat mussels. Nobody's going to care about that. They eat fish eggs. We are concerned about that. And the other thing that, that, that might bite us on the butt is they could do these things and increase the walleye population but because they'll be such an abundant source of food, they could decrease angler catch rates. We're going to be telling the angler's walleye population is going through the roof and they're not going to leave us because they won't be able to catch them anymore because they're too fat and happy. <laughs> so but we'll see. But again, another case where we have an invasive, we'd love not to have it, but once it's there, to be honest with ourselves, we're going to have to admit that it has both positives and negatives. And I think the final thing, if in fact what we all hope for is this nature as it was intended to be and, and not impacted by invasive species and the natural stuff. And, and I think the very first step we have to take is these people in 20 hats, put them back on their boats and send them back to Europe again because almost everything that we're talking about for aquatic invasive species has been facilitated by the activities of European settlers in North America. None of this crap was going on before we moved over here and started doing it. The natives didn't build the canals and they didn't ship ballast water back and forth across the ocean. So we have to admit our own role in all when we're talking about getting rid of all this stuff and just toss that out there as well. And that's not too bad. That's all I have for you today. Good job. Thank <laughs> you.